Thank you and good afternoon everybody. Uh, it's really great to see uh, you know, people face to face for the first time in a long time, so you know, really grateful for that. Um, I've got the sort of after lunch slot, so I'm going to think about you know, how I get you motivated. And I'm going to get you motivated with a disaster story. And like all good disaster movies, things start off really well, things take a dip, somewhere along the way we lose a few people, but we come out at the end happy and with success. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Now, anybody who knows me knows I'm a great lover of history. Um, and I always try and start anything I talk about, uh, talking about a little historical story. And uh, last time I spoke, I spoke about crime and punishment in the Victorian era. But today I'm going to go way, way, way back. So 65 million years ago. And if you imagine 65 million years ago, you were one of the dinosaurs. You were plodding around, chewing on grass and, you know, having a pretty lovely time, taking it easy. And with your head down, what you wouldn't have seen coming towards you, you know, very high speed, getting brighter and brighter in the sky, is this enormous asteroid, getting closer and closer. And when it landed, this thing, it's 15 to 20 kilometers wide. It has the impact, just to put it in perspective, of 500 billion times the impact of the Hiroshima bomb. It creates a 150 kilometer crater wide, and it wipes out everything on land that weighs more than 25 kilos. So what that made me think about is, procurement and when we're sort of with our heads down thinking about what's coming next and what that means for some of the teams that we have and what we do in future and what's going to make us successful and what's going to make us survive. So that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Some of those themes, some of the things I see in the industry and I think how we can address some of those challenges going forward and what's going to make us successful in the future. So I'm going to start here and this, this guy here, I'm moving forward now. This is around about 1930. This guy runs a shop in 1930. And as you can see, it's perfectly stocked out, but this guy's the gatekeeper for everything you want to get. Shelves stacked full of bits and pieces, but if you want anything, if you want one item, you've got to go and talk to this guy. And this guy, you know, for me is a little bit old world procurement. He's the guy you've got to go through, right? And if you want something, you've got to talk to him. You've got to convince him that that's the bit that you want. Now, if we think about what happened in retailing over time, actually, we've moved 1930s to the 1950s. The world had changed in the 1950s. So by the 1950s, still had a counter, still had a guy there or a lady, and you had a whole bunch of stuff that you could pick yourself, but sort of half and half. Roll on to where we are today, and what we see actually is you can go into a supermarket, you can pick your own product, you can bag it yourself, you can scan it yourself, and a step on from that, you know, you don't even have to go to the supermarket anymore. And I guess it's this real story of disaggregation and disintermediation. And I think procurement is very similar to this because, you know, if you think back to way back when, procurement was that gatekeeper. It was that bit you had to go through. It was the bit that, you know, created the rules and it created ultimately that point of frustration. And these people got disintermediated in the same way that if we don't change, we'll get disintermediated too. And, you know, the first part of that extinction story is really to think about what value are we adding in our role? Are we the blocker, the stopping people get the things they want to get? Or are we the facilitator of the market that's bringing all of those things together in a powerful ecosystem? And I'll talk more about the ecosystem later. So I used to show this, this graph quite a lot. And, um, you know, really it was a sort of chart about the history of procurement and about where we've come from and where we're going to. And, you know, right at that end was about being a simple kind of order raisers, process runners, pretty reactive, through to this end here, you know, the rise of the ecosystem, ESG, business people, digitized and data informed. Now, the truth about this graph is it's probably not quite right. And there's reasons why, I think, in its breadth and its, its depth. I think one of the things you find when you come to conferences like this is everybody shows you their best side. I think someone, someone I met at lunch talked about the Instagram picture of procurement. They talk about what's brilliant in their function. And, and the truth is that not everybody's as far up here as you, you, you might believe. And now there's two really interesting data points came out of the Deloitte um, Chief Procurement Officer Survey this year, which sort of taught me a little bit about breadth and depth. So the first was, if you think about, you know, people at this end here, if you looked at the highest performers in that CPO survey, 88% of them beat their financial savings target for that year, 88%. 
When you look at how many beat their supplier performance target, of that same high group, it was at 18%. And how many of them built, beat their innovation target in that same group, it was 8%. So that depth isn't quite as deep as you might think it'd be. People are still focused on savings over you know, some of the other things that you might expect to be seeing coming over here. Maybe that's an evolutionary thing, but you know, there's still plenty more work to do. And the truth about procurement functions is, as a function, it hasn't moved up this line in a consistent pace. In fact, you know, there are very different teams at each stage of, the, of this journey. And you know, I've certainly gone into organizations where I've worked and found people at all various different levels of this, this cycle. So I think we have seen some changes, but more change is needed. And you know, I'll explain some of the reasons why as we go through. So, you know, not to talk about things that people already know about, but we live in a really, really changing world. And supply chains are under a huge amount of pressure. And I think we've seen over the last couple of years the, the sheer human cost and economic cost of some of the things that have, that have gone on. And if you think of the things that, you know, we're thinking about at Thames every day, well, HGV driver shortages, you know, big issue for, for most industries, both here, Europe and America, but, you know, con continue to be a, a challenge. If we think about container costs, I mean, I heard a really interesting statistic the other day. Only 39% of containers are turning up on time. That is a phenomenal lag in a supply chain. Energy pricing. So, you know, we're seeing that and we're seeing, you know, a future potential geopolitical sort of move on, on energy. And what's that going to mean for how we think about energy in the future and, and how we drive that agenda? And then one, again, that's impacted us at Thames around semiconductors. So semiconductor shortage has shown us how there are some markets out there where actually they can be disrupted very, very easily with very major impacts. So all of that's meant that actually what we see is the focus on procurement and supply chains from the board has never been bigger. But it's also never been broader. So typically boards would have you know, talked to me about you know, how are we reducing the cost base? You know, what are we doing in that space? Now there's much more focus on both quality, speed, resilience. And they're things that for a lot of functions they haven't seen before. And I suppose part of my sort of thought process here is, is that we need to change as a function to be thinking about these things in the future, to be ready to proactively come up with solutions rather than reactively deal with problems as they arise. So supply chains. When I first did my SIPs exams way, way, way back when, you know, you talked about supply chain, and the supply chain seemed quite simple. It was, you know, so-and-so mines this, they make it into this, they manufacture that, they then deliver it to a, you know, someone who puts it all together, it gets distributed and you get it. But actually, supply chains aren't really like that. They're not as linear as that. They're not as simple as that. And I think we live in a world where actually uh, things are much more complicated and our customers' requirements for us to understand that complication have never been higher. So I, I don't think of supply chains anymore. I think of this, a more complex supplier ecosystem. And the supplier ecosystems, you know, is, this is sort of based on the internet, really, which is, if you think about how the internet was formed, it was designed not to be a sort of point-to-point -point thing. It was designed to be a many points-to-many points type relationships. And I think that's what our ecosystem looks like. And the challenge this creates is that, you know, if you want to understand what's going on at any point in your ecosystem, it's quite difficult. And I sat down with a group of CPOs the other day, and we were talking about uh, ethics in the supply chain. And, uh, you know, the question came to us, how do you make sure every point in your supply chain is doing the right thing ethically? And we all sort of sat around and scratched our heads a little bit and thought, yeah, it's, it's difficult because... In this world, it's quite easy. I go down the next thing and I sort of look at it and I think, yeah, that looks okay. And then the one before, well, that looks okay. In this world, it's very difficult to do without some form of digitization because the sheer scale and complexity and you know, the, the kind of incremental mathematics of it all make it very difficult to do. So thinking about how you get to grips with your ecosystem, again, is something I think you know, is one to, to focus on if, if uh, you know, we don't want to be disaggregated. So I sort of thought about this and thought about, um, you know, what do we need as a different approach within the profession? And there's a few things in here that, you know, I'd like to, to, to sort of talk about. And I think it's worth thinking about, you know, there's the left-hand side and there's the right-hand side. And, and which more of the side are we on? You know, what are we doing? And, you know, 
the sort of old world, they, they, down towards the other end of the evolutionary chart, is about being custodians of process. And, you know, the guy we saw in the shop, he's a custodian of process. You know, he manages the process, he manages it for you. But ultimately, he's not adding a lot more kind of intellectual capital beyond that. We've been about reactive to business issues. You know, are we that sort of front-footed partner that, that is really going to drive the business agenda forward? I always talk to my team about sort of wants and needs. You know, what the business wants, what our customers want. You know, think about what they really, really need. Um, Insular looking and lack of market awareness. I'm going to take you through something a little bit later, which is, is how we look at the world. Um, but it's really a point of thinking about how we become experts in our marketplace. I suppose if you sort of, sort of uh, look at that across the, the, the second part of it, it's about expertise and about how we build a team of experts to meet the business challenges. And you know, one thing I want to talk about here is um, customer centricity. So you know, the first people I heard in the procurement world talk about customer centricity was the guys at Proxima who are here. And they have this sort of, you know, very sort of fundamental view that your starting point has got to be looking at customers, whether that be your internal customers or your end customers. And that really sort of resonated with me because, one, you know, at Thames Water, we're on a big journey to become much more customer-centric, and we've got a CEO who's firmly placed us in, in that customer-centric world. But also, we've got to be thinking about what our stakeholders need to deliver the best, best service to customers. So, you know, I'm thinking about a world where we've got a team of experts who meet business challenges, you know, who are there to input into business strategy and budget. So you're there really, really early on. I'm going to give you an example. I, I went into one organisation, was not involved in the budgeting process whatsoever. Uh, two weeks before the budget's about to be published, the CFO phones me and he says, can we take another sort of couple of hundred million out of this? And you think, well, you know, that ship somewhat has, has sailed. These senior people who can engage and educate, and I've seen a few questions as we've gone through today talking about, um, you know, are soft skills really important? And for me, they're absolutely critical. Uh, and I can remember talking to an MD once where I had a brilliant sort of data pack, and, you know, there's a session on data earlier, and I do agree data is, is absolutely critical. But I gave him the data pack, and he said, you know, I said, look, the right supplier is A. And he said, I don't care, I want supplier B. And I said, well, look, I don't think you've read the pack. The pack data says A is the right answer. And he said, I don't care what your pack says, I want B. And it was a real lesson to me that hard data on its own is just data. Influence is really, really important too. So people who can influence and educate the organization are gonna be really, really important. Constructive challenge, I think again, another real big factor that, that I look for. So, you know, any good friend brings that constructive challenge to the, the organization. And my sort of view that, you know, our role is about bringing the best of the market in. You know, going out outside your normal parameters, finding what good looks like, and bringing that into, into your organization. Because I sort of have a fundamental belief that no matter what problem your business has got, someone out there has got a solution. You've just got to be able to find it. And it's the finding it with all the complexity that goes on that, that I think is a real challenge. So I would think about, you know, down here as well, thinking about how you deal with suppliers. And, you know, there's been an interesting shift in supplier relationships over the last few years because we're getting to a point where, in a lot of industries, suppliers are going to start to have the power and suppliers are going to make, uh, make choices about which clients they supply. So how do you become the home for innovation and how do you get, you know, suppliers focused on what you want to do and solving your business challenges? And I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about that in a moment. So, look, there's four things that I think, you know, are going to save us in, in this story, I suppose. So the first one's about digital solutions. You know, the scale and complexity of what we need to do is going to need digitizing, for sure. I think when you think about, um, you know, some of the simple processes, and I think, again, a question in, in the last session was really about, can you AI procurement? Well, you can certainly do some of it, and you can certainly take those pieces out of the process which are, you know, very manual, very process-heavy, to focus on you know, the more value-adding stuff. I think the second one's about you know, expertise. And I wrote an article a couple of years ago now about the three most important words in procurement. And to me, they're did you know. So about bringing thing, people things they didn't know time and time again on an ongoing basis, bringing them insight and, and knowledge. Next one's about supplier management. And as I say, I think that's going to be a really, really important area for us in the future. Um, you know, both in how we manage, manage suppliers. And 
I read an inter interesting article from uh, State of Flux, uh, the SRM business, and they were talking about, you know, they've measured sort of two to eight percent of value is lost in a contract uh, that is not managed. So a huge opportunity of value, and also a real opportunity to bring the best in from your suppliers, including new innovation. And this risk management piece, you know, working with suppliers to understand risks earlier, that's going to be a fundamental part of what we do in the future. And then the last one's about boldness. How do we get bolder about the solutions that we bring? I think there's, there's a, you know, we've come from a, a world where we've been a little bit sort of reticent to put our ideas forward. And actually, I'd encourage the whole profession to get bolder. And I can encourage my team to, to be bold and bring bold ideas. And you'll see that again in something I'll show you in a moment. So when I first got to Thames, uh, people talked a lot about fish finger sandwiches. Have you got your fish finger sandwich? Where's your fish finger sandwich? And I used to think, the hell are you going on about? And what Thames do is, is, is there's something which talks about what you're looking to do in your function. And I'm going to share my fish finger sandwich. And you'll realize why it's called a fish finger sandwich in a moment. So here's what it is. And the middle bit, I won't go through all of it, but I'm going to go through the middle bit because it talks about where directionally I want to take our team. So the first one really is about bringing some of that boldness to life. So bring game-changing ideas to life. So that's really about being bold, doing things that's going to change the business and improve things for our customers, but actually make them happen. Don't just have the idea. You do something to make it happen. So that's the boldness and the proactivity in there. Second one's about being recognized as experts in our field. So I asked the team, you know, to whatever area you're working in, close your eyes and imagine you were the best paid professional in that, that subject matter in the world. What would it mean you would know? What would it mean you could bring to the table? So that's our second one there. Third one, I talked about being a critical friend. So this is really about, you know, how you understand business needs, understand business challenges, but also not be afraid to push and challenge where you need to. And then create new value through our supplier relationships. So Thames is on a real supplier relationship journey, you know, something we haven't been that strong at, if we're being totally honest, over the last few years. And we're pushing much harder to, to bring our suppliers into the tent, to drive new areas of value. And, uh, you know, we're seeing some good early wins, but there's tons more work to do. And then understand and mitigate third-party risk. So how well do we understand what's going on in our supply chains and what are we doing about it? And that's a big focus for us, again, where we need to do, do much more work. So I thought I'd share our fish finger sandwich because it tells a little bit of directionally where, where I'm, I'm looking to take the team. Now, we're, you know, only part of our way on our journey. As I say, it's easy to come to these conferences and hear about what people have delivered, but we've actually got a long way on our journey to go. But we're making progress against these things. And these, this is the sort of North Star that's, that's driving us forward and underpinning us, you know, for the, the sort of customer targets that we're trying to hit. So who survives? And I suppose this is the interesting part about, you know, the change that's, that's needed. And um, I carry this around with me, or not all the time, you'd be pleased to know, but this, this you won't be able to see, it's part of a uh, rib cage of a triceratops. So, oh, it's a fossilized part of a rib cage of a triceratops. So this sits on a shelf at home, and it's a great reminder to me that, you know, ultimately, if you sort of stand around like a big lumbering dinosaur, looking into the ground, not really paying attention to what's going on around you, one day you might find yourself, you know, quite obsolete and ultimately turning to stone. And if I think about, you know, the who survives, there's... Um, you know, that sort of Darwin quote, and people always talk about the survival of the fittest. And actually what Darwin said, it's not, it's not the strongest or the fastest that survive, it's the most adaptable to change. And for us in procurement, you know, those changes have never been bigger. And I think if we don't move away from that process running, move into those things about really understanding our customers, bringing knowledge and insight to the marketplace, then I think we might find ourselves disaggregated to a world where our internal stakeholders can just buy from the market direct. So for me, that's going to be the difference about, you know, who survives or who, who thrives in the future. So thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Really, really interesting session. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, by the way, if you just want to throw a hand up and we'll bring a microphone over to you. OK, I've got a couple of questions here. Um, I think we have them on the screen. Yeah. Um, so you started off essentially uh, talking about how procurement was, is in the spotlight right now, procurement and supply chains. Do you think it's going to stay there? Or what, do you think when some of these issues that we've got at the moment that may have been caused by 
well, exas exacerbated by the pandemic. Once they rectify themselves, do you think procurement will still have that spotlight? Yeah, I, I think it will. I mean, it's interesting that the pandemic has moved on things that were happening anyway. You know, we can see that in the use of sort of digital um, versus sort of cash. You can see that in the flexible working in, in the days we have. So I think this was happening anyway. I think it's just brought it to people's attention that actually there's more to procurement than just saving money. I mean, interesting, supplier management is a great case in point where, you know, I've talked to a number of CFOs o over the years about supplier management and they say, well, what's it going to save me? Now, actually, the debate is, well, what's it going to cost me not to have it? So, so I, I think it is a fundamental shift. But equally, as I've said here, I think we need to move with it because if we don't move with it, I think maybe a whole bunch of other people might. So it's a call for change, really. But yeah, I think it will stay. Okay. And um, this is uh, going back to your point, talking about ethical supply chains. It's just um, something that another speaker was talking about earlier when it comes to understanding how different uh, cultures might look on different um, aspects. So how do you decide what is ethical? Is it down to each company to decide what their parameters are? I think it's down to a few people, actually. I think it's partly down to companies. I think it's partly down to the public and, you know, your sort of stakeholders. Um, I suppose we think about ethics, you know, in, in quite a broad sense about, you know, how we treat the environment, where our products come from. Um, but I think... Um, I think uh, Alex Jennings spoke about it earlier, actually. Ultimately, the things that you do that might be, um, you know, give you competitive advantage today become the norm in future. And I think, you know, ultimately the general public is setting organisations a much higher standard for ethics in the future. So, so for me, you know, that's the biggest driver. You know, what does the public expect you to do? Mm. And then I think, you know, companies you know, have their own policies beneath that, but ultimately customer sentiment drives it, I think. Do you think a lot of the change that we're seeing is, is the, um, a pull factor from the consumers? Because the, the consumers want uh, companies to be ethical, they want sustainability. Is, is that what's driving change within organisations or are they actually pushing forward as well? I think there's a bit of both um, because I think there are still issues out there where companies are pushing where maybe the pull isn't quite there for, from consumers. So, you know, if I think about my industry, we think about water usage. You know, one of the things we're going to have to do over, over the next few years is reduce water usage. And, you know, that's a conversation we need to have with our customers over time. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, there's a bit of a generational shift going on, I think. You know, as you see, you know, a slightly younger generation moving through. I think how they make their buying decisions is much more influenced by some of this stuff in, in, in future. So I think that's partly driving too. So I wouldn't say it's one or the other. I think they're moving together at, you know, at the same time. Okay, and when it comes to water usage, you mentioned there um, about having to reduce that. Is, is that um, partly down to changing human behaviour or, or does technology have a role to play in ensuring we don't waste as much water? Well, there's a few things, I think. There's one which is, you know, we're working very hard as an organisation to reduce the amount of water leakage that happens in the network every day, so that's, a, you know, water saving. But I think, you know, if we think about sort of the environmental impact of a lot of water usage, uh, I think that's partly consumer behaviour. But, you know, we've got to work with our consumers to, to you know, help them with that, that challenge. Um, you know, there will be technology that can be brought in to help with that, and that may be, you know, meters or things you can put in your home that actually start to give consumers a bit more of an informed choice about, you know, the water consumption they're having and, you know, what sort of impact that might, that might have in the future. Okay. Are there any questions from the floor before I ask my final question? It doesn't seem to be okay. Now, going back to the dinosaur analogy, right? Now, at the beginning, you said everything that was over 25 kilos was effectively wiped out. Yeah. So Most people in this room. Most people. <laughs> uh, there are some exceptions. Um, most people in this room, for sure. Um, taking that analogy, does that mean that if we don't look up and look around, the SMEs and innovators would still survive necessarily? And maybe dinosaur gargantuan organisations are the ones that are going to get wiped out? Yeah, may maybe. I mean, I, I think there's advantages to being fleet of foot. And I suppose it's not really a big is bad kind of pitch. It's more a are you adapting to the change and, you know, can you see things coming and are you doing something about it? So I think, you know, my sort of sense on the SME front is that um, actually 
we're going to see far more SMEs playing in, their, in the corporate space. And, you know, one of the things we've got to do as larger organisations is reduce some of those barriers for SMEs to actually operate. I think at the moment, it's far too difficult for SMEs to deal with a lot of big organisations. And that's partly because of artificial barriers that get put in the way. I don't think they're deliberate, but, you know, when you sort of, you send out your um, ITTs or your RFIs or whatever, and you're asking, you know, for people who are, who's their board director on sustainability and what policy have they got for that, it just starts to make it very difficult for smaller businesses to engage. So I think that will change, and I think smaller businesses will start to be a larger proportion of big, big corporates, but there'll always be a place for the, for the big guys too, for sure. True. So um, how is Thames Water addressing that in terms of making the, the barrier to um, entry for smaller SMEs as, as a supplier to Thames Water? Yeah, there, there's a couple of things. So we've started a, a debate with the supply chain around, you know, how it feels to, to work with Thames and, you know, some of the challenges that they face. And that's made us really think about um, some of our engagement approaches. So, you know, simple things like looking at your documentation and, and thinking about what are the things in here that might put a, a SME off, or you know they're not going to have the capability to respond to thinking about more flexibility around sort of risk provisions or insurance provisions in those sort of services where you know there may be lower risk to us and i think you know just engaging with the market to say we're open for business for those kind of conversations so you know if you get an email from a thames person at the moment you'll see a little bit at the bottom which says that if you've got an idea or you think you can help you know, click on this link and it will take you through to something where you can engage with us more powerfully. Mar marrying that with our sort of supplier management program means that, you know, we've got dedicated people who can now interface with the market and sort of help people manage through the, the rocks of a big organisation. Okay. All right. I think that's all we've got time for. So thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.